We're here at the Rialto. This is your first big performance. What are you feeling coming in today? I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm, I've been spending all day trying to ramp down the excitement, trying to contain it, because I'm like, I'm giddy. You know, maybe 2% maybe nervous, but I've done this enough to where I'm just, I'm excited to get up here and share this time with everybody that's here. This is the theater where I saw my very first movie, E.T., The Extraterrestrial, back in 1982. So my mom took me here. We lived up on Prospect Street. I was born right here in town. So a lot of big life events have happened here in this town. And the fact that the Rialto is still open and we have it to enjoy, and I have it for this, this is just amazing. So I'm really looking forward to filling this place up. You mentioned E.T. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there's a correlation with that movie of E.T. coming from another world and joining Elliot on Earth? Do you think that there's a, a little hint? So th there is, there is. And I was thinking about this because I actually watched this a couple days ago. And I love the fact that not only does E.T. come from this other world, he comes here looking for plants. You know, he's a botanist, a scientist. So he's very ecologically minded and he's all about the love. And the very last thing he says to Elliot before he takes off is, be good. And our spirits couldn't want anything more for us. So recently, Isaac, my husband and I, we, we have a store in Littleton. We started out a long time ago uh, at the farmer's market. We were Deep Earth Farm. And then opening our store, we became Deep Earth Arts. Deep Earth Arts is still open, still there. We've opened up a publishing house recently. So it's Deep Earth Press. So as a kid, I never had any of these ideas that this stuff was even possible. So I never even had a dream of being a psychic or a medium. When I was really small, the only dream I ever had was to be a writer. So I've accomplished that. I've written a couple books, but part of this process of working with people, working with their beloved dead, working with their ancestors is the idea of capturing their stories and preserving it for future generations, their descendants, everybody. So where we go from here or where I go from here, it's all about the books, it's all about the stories, it's about continuing this work, but in a larger aspect, it's really about helping people preserve their stories, Pres preserve the stories of those who they've lost, who they love, who are maybe even still alive. So it's really about what our world's gonna look like in a hundred years and what sort of history, what stories we can preserve now to make the world a better place in a hundred, 200, 300 years. And I never thought I'd be here. Right, <laughs> So yeah. where I go from here, I really don't know. I'm very much you know, a person of faith and I have a lot of trust in how I'm being led, where I'm being led. So I'm, I'm also one of these people that like to think I can do everything so I don't see either or. What I do really appreciate is that my life, for whatever reason, has been filled up with everybody that also has these same kind of dreams, these same kind of visions. So it's not like I'm doing this publishing house by myself. I've got a whole lot of people that that's actually what their dream was. So, you know, it's part of, I guess it's just kind of riding alongside what I'm doing. And I know that as I grow, as Deep Earth Arts grow, as Isaac in his stuff grows, that the publishing house will grow, but also help other people that are part of it. Final thoughts? Uh, yeah. Leave your expectations at the door. I just ask that folks come to this with an open mind. Without further ado, Josh Simon. Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me. Wow, this is amazing. So before we get into the thick of this evening, I want to start with a story. Not my story. It's going to, you know, it involves me. But I'm going to start with a story, and it is one where, at the risk of sounding like my favorite Sicilian, I feel like I'm about to go, picture it, Littleton, 2018. <laughs> it's right around then. I want you to imagine late... 2018, early 2019. 
The gentleman that was checking everybody in, that is my husband, as Chad had said, Isaac. Isaac and I had our very first retail location in Littleton. We are Deep Earth Arts. Right now, we have a location on Cottage Street. At this point in time, we were underneath Crumbar in Littleton. If anybody is familiar with Crumbar, it's right across from the public library. Great people, great coffee, great baked goods. We were under <coughs> there, and it's an old art gallery, if you will, so it's very long, very narrow. Some people here may have actually visited our location while we were there. So I want you to imagine it. It's split halfway down the middle. We've got our retail stuff on one side. Isaac would be helping customers. And then on the other side, behind some curtains, I had my reading space. So this is 2000, late 2018, early 2019. This was right when I started to become comfortable using the word medium. When I started this, I wasn't a medium, I wasn't talking to dead people, I wasn't doing any of that stuff. But at this point in time, that stuff had started to really happen and unfold for me. Now, I want you to imagine that I'm sitting at this table. I'm sitting at a, many of you have been there, I'm sitting at a little round kitchen table, it's wooden, it's got a candle on it, I've got a light over it. And I'm sitting with a woman. She's 85 years old. Is Cindy. I'm making that up. That's not a real name, but I'm making it up. Her name's Cindy, and I'm sitting across from her, and she's in her 80s. At this point in time, I was about 40. So this woman is roughly the age of my grandmother. Now, she'd heard about me. She set an appointment with me, and she sat with me because she had lost her husband of 55 years. I want you to wrap your head around that. Here I am, a 40-year-old. I'm not even as old as their marriage. And here's this woman who could be my grandmother, sitting with me, hoping to hear from her husband. And it starts to happen for me. It does. In the way that I do this, in the way that I receive messages, it starts to happen. So I start to receive a message from Cindy's husband. I start to smell barbecue. I start to smell barbecue. And I'm like, hmm, OK. Well, where he's at, he's got his barbecue. He's barbecuing. The next message he sent me was him standing next to a river fishing. I could see the water. I could feel the water. I could smell the fish. He was very excited. He had his barbecue. He had his fishing. Then the next message came, and it got really awkward for me. Now, as you've all put it together, You've already met my husband, so that makes me a gay man. So I lay that down as context for the rest of everybody here because the next message certainly wasn't coming from me. <laughs> All of a sudden, in my head, were these really well-endowed women. <laughs> really well-endowed women. And they were on the cover of some magazines, okay? So here I am sitting with this woman, she's 85, 85, okay? And I'm like, wow, you know, he's got his barbecue, and he's fishing, and, 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 I'm having a real hard time telling you this, Cindy. I don't know how to say this. I don't mean to be awkward. I don't mean to be crass. I don't mean to be inappropriate. He's got his barbecue, and he's got his fishing, and he wants you to know he's got his Playboy magazines. <laughs> and I say this to her, and she looks right at me, 100% serious, and she goes, why is that hard to say? Those are his favorite things. <laughs> so that should give you an idea as to what happens to me. So now we're going to back up, and we're going to start about 40 years prior to that on a cold winter day in March 1979. Now, I am going to pick on her a little bit throughout the course of this evening, but my mother's here, right here in the front row. Big mama. Mama. Mom. Awesome. Back in March 1979, she gave birth to me up at the Lancaster Hospital. This is literally my hometown. I was delivered by Dr. Shields. Does anybody remember Dr. Shields here? Yeah, I mean, that's an old name, right? Dr. Shields. 
So I was delivered by Dr. Shields. I was a big baby, very big as, I mean, not hard to <laughs> venture that. And my parents had an apartment up on Prospect Street, right up here, right up here in one of those houses, still there. Now, as I was a small kid, I'm gonna use this opportunity to ask everybody here to drop their expectations. I've shared with you a little bit of a story as to what happens for me when I step into this position, but I want everybody here to drop their expectations around psychics, around mediums, around the world of spirit, around the world of our beloved dead, where we go when we pass away, all of that. I am most likely going to challenge a lot of people's beliefs here, so I'm going to ask you to keep an open mind. Please keep an open mind and leave those expectations at the door. Now, one of the things that makes me different in this role is that there are a whole lot of people who do this. They do it professionally, they do it non-professionally, they do it on TV, they do it in movies, they do it in the area. I'm very different than all of them, as you're about to see, but one of the things that makes me very different is I do not claim to have talked to spirits as a child. This is an important distinction for me, a really important distinction. This stuff happened to me late in life. A lot of people who do this like to build up a mythology around them, and maybe they were speaking to spirits as a child, maybe they weren't. But what I can tell you is that the work that I do and what happens to me happens with the help of spirit. It's also really goddamn traumatic. It can be very hard work. I am dealing with people who have suffered incredible traumas, deaths, losses beyond measure, the hardest things a human can deal with. The stuff that happens to me, very hard to deal with. And I know that the spirits that help me do what I do would not do that to a child. So I like to take this opportunity to just set everybody's expectations correctly. When I was a little kid, I just liked scary stuff. That's it. I was a little freak. I loved Stephen King. I loved Nightmare on Elm Street. I loved all the scary stuff. In fact, tonight, this evening, is really significant to me because my mother brought me to my very first movie here in this theater, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. <laughs> Hell yeah, E.T. That, was, that came out June 11th, 1982. I had to look up the release date because I couldn't remember if it was E.T. or Gremlins. Gremlins was the next one and I loved it. Now, it's funny because I was talking to Chad about this and Chad's like, did you get nervous during Gremlins? He's like, I had to get up and get out of the theater a couple times. And I'm like, no, I was pissed off at the kid in front of me because he wouldn't stop moving because I wanted to see the monsters. That was literally me. And I loved the scary stuff. And I was the kid who was reading Stephen King at like seven or eight. Now, my mom, my dad, hard working people. My mom was a waitress, my dad was a construction worker. Now I'm gonna dive into my story a little bit more deeply here because I have such incredible roots. I was born here. This was where I had my first movie. My mom was a waitress a couple doors down at the Lancaster Diner. Anybody ever go to the Lancaster Diner? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can remember cinnamon rolls, okay? That's my mom for me, right? So here I am, a little kid, when I was at Five years old or so, my parents got smart, decided to buy a house, and they moved across the river into Lunenburg, where the property taxes were lower. <laughs> so that's Vermont for you, lower property taxes. They moved over there, they bought this little house, and they were working on it, building it. My sister was a couple years younger than me, and here I am, the son of a waitress, the son of a construction worker, and all I wanted to do was read. One of my favorite things to do was to go yard sailing with my mother so I could find out all these like old 25 cent horror novels. That's it, I was just a kid that loved reading these Dean Koontz books, Stephen King books, all of that had my nose in it. And my parents didn't care because I wasn't beating up on my sister. Because <laughs> I did a lot of that, you know. Sibling rivalry and all that, you can ask her later. Now, 
Fast forward a little bit, here I am growing up, here I am growing up, and I am truly a kid of the 80s, truly a kid of the 80s, truly a kid of the 90s, and I promise to share this really embarrassing story with everybody here because I think it's useful for people to know that I get embarrassed as well as in the fifth grade. Mom, you're gonna love this. I was in the, yeah, be careful, she says. <laughs> I was in the fifth grade and I loved Nintendo. I loved reading, I loved, I loved going to Lancaster Video, right down here by the ice cream shop and renting VHS tapes. I loved it, it was one of my favorite things to do. But I also loved Nintendo. Now I want you to imagine, I graduated the eighth grade at 6'3", so I was a very large kid. This is the summer of my fifth grade. Summer of my fifth grade, I was playing The Legend of Zelda on Nintendo. Indian style, cross-legged, on my living room floor for so long, my legs fell asleep. They did, fell right asleep, just sat there forever. And as a kid, I was like, well, you know, the way that you wake your legs up is you stand on them, right? Well, I did that and I heard a big crack. You're looking at literally the only guy who's ever broke his ankle playing Nintendo. <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly. So if I walk across the stage with a little bit of a limp, you'll know why. All right? So I grew up, I went through middle school, I went to high school at the academy over in St. Johnsbury. It was a public school, just transported back and forth. I was a kid in the 90s. I raised hell, I didn't go to college. I was going to, but then something happened where I didn't go to college, so I kept working at Butson's. Like, I worked with Dave, Dave Fuller at Butson's, way years and years ago, I worked at Butson's. Then I spent a couple years causing problems, being a troublemaker. And then, in 2003, I had a child with a high school sweetheart. Now, I was still in the closet at this time. Everything happens for a reason, but he's right here. My 20-year-old son, right there. Yeah. Wave for everybody. Well, if I'm going to be embarrassed, you are too, but so <laughs> that's what it's about. Anyways, here he is, a beautiful little guy. At three years old, his mother and I separated, and that's when I came out of the closet with a vengeance. Spent a couple years having some questionable, problematic relationships. And fast forward to 2008, when I was selling cell phones at US Cellular, right down here. Right, I mean, here's Lancaster again, right down here, selling cell phones. Probably too many of you folks here. <laughs> crazy, crazy job, it really was. On the weekends, I had my son, and we would go camping, we would, have dinner, and I would always love going to the farmer's market to buy vegetables. One day, September 2008, I see the man that you're about to see with a microphone as a vendor, Isaac, my husband. And I really don't like leaning into corny stuff, but I will for this. I fell in love with him immediately, immediately. And we kind of have this story, and I know he's going to want me to tell it, I was so overcome with him, like I couldn't, I, couldn't even, I couldn't even talk to him. It was very awkward, okay? The very first word that I ever said to him, I walk up to him and I said, corn? <laughs> just like that. And he, thinking I was just a sociable human being, looks at me and goes, good morning. And I said, no, corn? <laughs> he didn't have any corn, okay? Eventually I worked up the courage to talk to him and we hung out once. And since then, since 2008, we have been attached at the hip. Now, the difference between he and I when we met was this. He had had a very religious childhood. I had not. My parents rode motorcycles. His parents read Bibles. Way different people. Really, truly different people. And when I met him, he had worked through a lot of that. And he was into more alternative spiritualities. He was into Reiki, shamanism, herbalism. He was into tarot cards, crystals, all of this stuff. And it was literally the guy that was like, babe, have fun playing Dungeons and Dragons, but please don't hurt yourself or hurt other people. I truly was that guy. And I paint that picture for you so you can see how strange this entire process was for me. Now, we had spent years and years together from 2008 to 2016, when things were gonna get really weird for me. I'm gonna back up a little bit though, because I don't like talking about myself, but I want everybody here to have a really good understanding of what happened to me, and I want everybody here to have a really good understanding 
about how things go in your life, how it's important to listen to our intuition, to listen to the nudges that we receive. Very, very important. So that's one of the reasons why I tell my story. One, to give you the proper expectations as to what's going on here, but two, so you can see how amazing your own story is. Now, I already told her that I was gonna drop her name, and I don't see her, but she might be here. She's, and she knows who I'm talking about because I reached out to her today to see if I could actually drop her name. She'd be okay with it. So, I had a couple on and off jobs. I ended up working in Littleton for a software company that lasted about four years. It became very just monotonous. I was doing the same thing over and over. I was in my car one day and I heard an advertisement on the FM radio, not the satellite radio, not the internet radio, but the FM radio about the radio stations over in Vermont looking for sales help. And I heard it and I was intrigued, love music, kid of the 80s, sales help, radio, why not? I took a severe pay cut. It took me about six months to apply for that job. The manager of that radio station said to me, he goes, listen, I have to hire for this position. This is going to be the worst job you ever have. <laughs> Truly. He hired me over the course of six months, and I said to him, I, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care. I have a pretty awful job, just in the way that it was boring and I wasn't going anywhere, and I wanted to experience something. Even if I had a pay cut, even if I was going to have a hard time doing it, I wanted to experience something. I wanted to learn. I wanted to do something different than just make some millionaire more money. It was awful. So I decided to take the job, even though the guy said it was going to be the worst job I ever had. Sales help, sales in and of itself is tough. It is a tough, tough job to do. So I decided that I was just going to do what they were training me to do, go around all of these little businesses and see if they could use Radio. Radio is a waste of your money. It really is. Unless you're a car, like a, a, a dealership or a bank or somebody with lots and lots of money, you need a lot of money to make radio work effectively. Now, here I am, 2013. I am running a special for the Lancaster Fair. They have a package. They got a package of sales ads that they want to run for the fair. So here I am in this area where I met my husband, where we were kind of doing farmer's market stuff, where I had known people from selling them cell phones. And so I'm wandering around in these businesses seeing if they would want any radio ads. Now, I'm across the street here on this day in September 2013. And I walk into this store called New to You Consignments. Do people know Amy Landry here? All right. Amy... I thank her deeply for doing the best thing ever to me and kicking me out of her goddamn store. <laughs> she did. She did. Sweet. I had helped her and her family with cell phones. She knew who I was. And I go into that store and I tell her who I'm representing. And she goes, stop right there. Get out. She escorted me out. It wasn't me. It was the company I was working for. That was so significant to me at that time. I had run into that from time to time with businesses. This radio station had been around for 20, 30 years and had upset a lot of people. I was finding that out by getting all of their really crappy old accounts. That's what they did to me to cut my teeth. So I'm in Amy's store. Amy escorts me out. Best thing that could have ever happened to me because in October 2013, I get an idea. Here's an idea. Out of all of these businesses that I'd worked with, I'd found that none of them were doing social media correctly. None of them were doing it hardly at all. They weren't doing anything on their website. And when I was working with them for radio, I'd be like, well, you know, what's going on in your website? What's going on in the newspaper? Let's see if you get a radio ad. Let's see if we can make a gel and all that. Nobody's updating their hours on their Facebook pages. Nobody's doing any of that stuff. Nobody's taking pictures of their food or talking about what movies they have planned. It's been a, been a long time since 2013. I decided to go around and tell people that I would run their social media for them. I just start taking pictures and posting their flowers and their food and all of that. And I loved it. 
I loved working with locally owned businesses. I didn't want to devote any of my energies to the banks or the car dealerships or any of that. They got plenty of monies. They got multi-million dollar uh, accounts that can do that. I wanted to help out the mom and pop shops because my mom and dad, they both came from farming families. Yeah, but when I was in middle school, they started their own masonry business. So they were working. My mom was working. She'd come home to the books. My dad's working. I mean, I just wanted to help out these small businesses. So 2013, I just started to do that. In 2015, I was in a yoga class with Kat Kobe. There's another name, Lunenburg area. I was in this yoga class, and all of a sudden, I got an idea. That idea was North Country Local. So North Country Local was this idea. I was going to take and work with a business, feature a business every day, and they were going to give away a $50 gift certificate. We we're going to use social media to boost it up. I think it's up to like 15,000 people or... It's, 16,000 people now. It's a pretty big presence, but I had this idea of I didn't want to work with businesses that weren't owned by here. I actually told people, no, thank you. You don't live here. You don't own your business here. I'm going to only work with people that are from here. Now, I did that uh, right up until about 2016 when all of a sudden things were going to get really weird for me. And now we're starting to lay the stage for the Twilight Zone. 2016, Christmas, my husband Isaac, he got me a DNA test for Christmas. The DNA test, you, everybody's familiar with it, spin a tube, send it off, get the information back. I had one grandparent that I knew, my grandmother Edith, my mom's mom. I didn't have an opportunity to know any of my other grandparents. My grandmother, an old farmer, she had family from Canada, she affectionately referred to herself as a stick and Frenchman. She was very proud of it. Very, very proud of it. And I was like, well, you know, we're about an hour south of Canada. I must be French, too. The DNA test determined that was a lie. Okay? I didn't have a lot of French in me. I had a lot of English, Scottish, Scandinavian, a lot of Northern European. I had a little bit of Portuguese. I had some strange things that were really intriguing to me. And that's when I started to build my family trees. Started to build my family trees. I signed up for Ancestry.com. Hello? Hello? Started, signed up for Ancestry.com, and that's when all this stuff started to happen to me. I was putting family trees together, and I want you to imagine this. Here I am running a marketing business. I am having appointments and sessions and lunches and dinners with people that I didn't know. And all of a sudden, I would be sitting with them, and I'd be smelling barbecue. I'd be having some really peculiar things happen to me, and it was scary. And that's another thing that I'm not ashamed to admit. It was very scary. Because I want you guys to go back to that person who was like, babe, you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know? The, the spirit stuff's not real. I think, I, it's not that I didn't think it was real. I think I looked at spirituality like nuclear physics. It's real, but the people who are messing with it should have degrees or be you know, trained on how to mess with it. So when this stuff started to happen to me, it freaked me out, and I pulled back from it. And I think that we can all relate from this. We all get scared of things, and when we get scared of things, we pull back from it. The fact that everybody's here tonight, curious, yes, but also courageous. There's a lot of people that wouldn't be sitting in your seats terrified of this stuff. So the fact that y'all are here shows that you're brave. But we got to start there. Now, here I am having this stuff happen to me. And any time it happened to me, I'd put the brakes on. I don't want it happening. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want anything to do with it. I would look elsewhere. I would make it stop. But what I did continue doing is I continued building my family trees. And I really encourage everybody here to build their family trees. Now, my last name is Simons. My dad was a Simons from Dalton. I'm the seventh generation of Simons that lived in Dalton and Lunenburg. Back and forth, back and forth. My son, he's the eighth generation. That, that's some roots. Now, I appreciate the Simons name, of course, my dad's name, but I also appreciate my mom's last name, Santi. My mom is a Santi from the Lyman area. And then I appreciate my father's mother's last name of Remington. I appreciate my mother's mother's last name of Coyer. 
And here's why. I'm not just my dad's kid. I'm not just my mom's kid. I'm my grandparents' kid as well. And everybody here has that in common with me that we come from parents, we come from grandparents. On top of that, we all come from people who suffered and had incredible lives, incredibly difficult lives. I'm gonna use my dad's mother as an example. I never got to meet her. She passed away when I was two. My father's mother gave birth to my father in 1958 at the age of 47. 47! Makes me wanna just clench right up, I swear. I'm 44, I got a 20 year old boy right there. Man, 20 year old man, 20 year old man. I got a 20 year old man right there. And I can't imagine having a newborn in three years. My grandfather was 52, 52, it blows me away. He passed away when my dad was eight years old. He passed away at 60. I never got to meet him either. But those lives, those stories had a repercussion on me, on my family, on my child, on everybody that came from that family. Now, my mom's parents had it rough. My mom had it rough. My dad had it rough. I like to consider myself the first softborn Simons. My dad tells stories about how the water in his toilet was frozen as a kid. My mom tells stories about how she'd look out her wall and be able to look out the, the naughty pine hole, seriously, of like looking out into the weather. My parents had incredibly difficult lives and every single person here, you have that in common with me. Your grandparents, your great grandparents struggled and because of that, they were strong. And I'm gonna really just pause there. It doesn't mean they were good people means they were strong people. It doesn't mean they were ethical or moral or virtuous. It means they were strong. So the foundation of this evening is that everybody here has strength inside of them. Everybody here has attributes and qualities that come from their ancestors. But everybody here has strength, guaranteed. You might not know it. You might not feel it. You might not see it. But you do. And everybody here has gifts and attributes, skills and qualities that nobody else has. So I'm up here on the stage sharing mine. Everybody here, you're gonna leave this show tonight, you're gonna go into your lives, and I'm going to invite you to lean into the gifts, the attributes, the qualities, and the skills that only you have, because those gifts, qualities, skills make this world a better place. They do, and that's why you have them. So, with that being said, that dawned on me as I was doing my family trees and I kept digging into their stories, it really dawned on me that I'm here because of them. I'm here because some 47-year-old woman in 1958 decided to try to have another daughter and ended up with my father. I'm here because of that. I shouldn't even be here. My dad shouldn't even be here. But what's fascinating is most of us here probably shouldn't be here, considering where our grandparents, great-grandparents, and everybody else that was before them, what they all went through. So with that understanding, this is what I decided to do. I took inspiration from my ancestors. I took inspiration from my parents, in fact. And instead of running away from the scary thing, I decided to run toward it. I did. I decided to figure it out because one, I was frustrated and I had no idea what this was, but I was also the kid that loved scary stuff and I was like, well, I wanna figure it out. I wanna see what this is all about. So this is what I decided to do. I decided Halloween of 2017, and I'm giving everybody a timeline here so everybody knows what happened. Halloween of 2017, I decided to run a science experiment. And I want everybody here to do this with their own life. I got into this because of science and a DNA test. I went through high school. I know what the scientific method is, and I decided to use it. The scientific method, if you all are familiar with it and can remember, basically running an experiment and drawing data from that experiment. I had a hypothesis. I had some really weird stuff happening to me, and I wanted to figure it out. So I had my husband set up a night, Halloween 2017. I wanted to give reading to people that I didn't know, and so I had them come in front of me, one after the other after the other. I think I have to stay over here, Chad, for this mic to work better. Yeah, I think I'm getting over there a little bit. I'm gonna try to stay over here, it fades out. So I decided to figure it out by running a science experiment. Nine people, nine readings, 
and this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to sit in front of people and I wanted to see if what I was receiving was accurate, was tangible, and was evidential. When you hear the word medium, you're going to want to hear the word evidential behind it. That's evidence that somebody is feeling, seeing, experiencing something that isn't, they shouldn't know. Something that they shouldn't know. Not something that they're making up, but something that they shouldn't know, something specific. And I wanted to figure that out, and that's what I did. Nine readings, boom, 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 boom. Some really strange things happened to me, and I figured it out. This stuff was coming externally. It was coming from outside of me. Now, on top of that, the other common denominator with that was everything that I was receiving, I was receiving on behalf of somebody's well-being. This is super important, super important. Because I could just be receiving random stuff. That's not what happens. When I sit with a person, and you guys are about to see this, when I sit with somebody, what happens is their spirits, their ancestors, their beloved dead want the best. They do. They want the best for your heart. They want the best for your body. And they want the best for your home. Those seem to be the three areas that I can, I'm concerned with when I sit down and I give readings to people. Heart, health, and home. And I see some familiar faces in this studio or this theater that I think can relate to that in their time spent with me. Heart, health, home. Now, with that being said, I want to explain to you all, and this is something that I want to make sure everybody gets from here, I want everybody to know that I figured out what this stuff was, but I'm not the only one that has it. So I want to explain to you exactly what goes on with me and exactly what goes on with everybody here. Everybody here has intuition. Intuition. Intuition is a human attribute. It's a human gift, like athleticism, artistry, singing. Everybody's got a little bit of it. Some people got a lot of it. But let me tell you what intuition is. Intuition is your spirits, your beloved dead, your loved ones moving through you. And now I'm the science guy. I got to figure this out and I got to have the tangible proof of how it works. So I want you to think about it like this. And again, I'm a spiritual person. I'm not a religious person. I'm not going to ask you guys to believe in specific religions or spiritualities. That's not what I'm doing here. And I want you to see that what I have figured out and what I've determined is global and universal to everybody. So the first thing, when we pass away, we do not poof out of existence. We do not go away. We do not disappear for all time. We carry on. And I want you to think about your human existence right now, like the body that you have as a horse. And I want you to think about the spirit or the soul that you have as a rider. When you pass away, the rider gets off the horse and your horse is buried or burnt or what have you. Now, when we lose our horse, when we go to the world of spirit, let me tell you what else I figured out. It's not some far distant planet. It's not some far distant dimension. The afterlife, heaven, paradise, call it what you want. I'm going to tell you right here and right now, it is right here. Right here, right here with us. I want everybody to think about it like this, please. We are on the other side of a one-way mirror. Everybody seen a one-way mirror in a cop show, in a police drama? We pretty much sit on the side of the suspects, pretty oblivious to what's going on on the other side. They sit on the side of the police, the detectives. They know us, they feel us, they see us. And they are where our intuition comes from. Anybody in this room who would refer to themselves as intuitive knows they're intuitive because the very worst things that ever happened to them in their lives happened because they didn't listen to their intuition. I know a whole lot of people can relate to that. I should have listened to myself. I should have listened to it. I knew it about that person. I knew it about that situation. I shouldn't have gone that way. That's your intuition. Now, scientifically, I want you to know how it works so you can start to trust yourself. 
Our spirits are going to move through the intuitive, emotional part of our brain, the right side of our brain. We have the left side of our brain, which is the rational and the intellectual. Our spirits are moving through us all the time. They are sending us messages. They are giving us a positive feeling in this direction, a negative feeling in that direction, because they can see those things. And they're trying to send us that message. Most of us aren't listening. Pretty much everybody is not listening. It takes about a second and a half to two seconds before your rational intellectual mind kick in and you start to translate it in your own voice. I've done this thousands of times with people. I have sat with people thousands of times and I will say to them, I'll be like, well, I think you should probably ride a horse. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was just thinking about riding a horse. And I'm like, well, you weren't thinking about it. You were receiving it. But because of the nature of our relationship with spirit, most of us don't even know that. And I'm sure that most of us can relate to the fact that because we didn't listen to our intuition, we ended up in trouble. We ended up in problems. So I want you to take this, please. Your spirits are watching you like you're a TV show, truly. Like a movie, like a TV show. And just like when you guys are watching a TV show or a movie, and you yell at the character in the movie, like, don't go upstairs, don't split up, don't do that, don't do that. That's what your spirits are doing to you. And they're trying to send you a message from behind that mirror to go in a certain direction, to take care of yourselves, to be gentle on yourselves in the way that they would want you to. That's what I've determined. Now, I am just a Yahoo that got frustrated because I needed to figure this stuff out as it was happening to me. And I've placed myself in this position of helping to bring these messages to people because one, I want to honor my ancestors. I've decided to lean into this so I don't squander their struggles. I don't squander their lives and everything that they went through so I could sit here and play on my phone. I'm not gonna be that guy. If you guys decide to squander your abilities, squander your lives, that's on you. But I'm not gonna do that. And I want everybody to see that as inspiration, hopefully, to really lean into your life and give it all you have. Because your ancestors, your loved ones in spirit are watching you and really hoping that you can. Now, one of the things, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this, because one of the things that I'm being led to tell everybody here is this. I am my grandmother's grandson. I might use her French, so if I swear, well, it's an adult event, right? Okay. Now, the other thing is I don't lean into what I call the woo. You're not gonna hear much in the way of new age spirituality, new age woo, you're not gonna hear much of that up here. And there's a reason, a lot of it doesn't make sense and a lot of it is disempowering. I am literally the guy that does not even like to use the term spirit guides. A lot of people have heard that term spirit guides. I don't even use that term. What I like or what I prefer because it describes them to me is our spirits, our ancestors are like umbrellas. They're like umbrellas. We carry them around, they're over us, they guide us, they heal us, they shield us however they can. I don't like the term spirit guides because of this. I'm gonna tell you a story. We have this store in Littleton. We see lots of people. I saw a woman come into the store one time and she says to me, she goes, oh, you know, my daughter, she's moving. My spirit guides, they just don't want her to go. And I had to look right at her and I'm like, woman, that's not your spirit guides, that's your anxiety. <laughs> so I do want everybody here to lean into their intuition but how do we know the difference between intuition and paranoia or fear? I'm gonna to get to that later. I'm not gonna leave you hanging, but I wanna entice you a little bit. Before this evening is up, I am going to give you the secret to life. It's a bold goddamn statement. I know it is, I know it is. My mom's headed out of here so I can swear a little bit more. She doesn't like when I swear, so. It's a bold goddamn statement, and I know, but I want everybody to know that I can give you the secret to life, and I'm gonna share that with you before this evening is up. Now, as I do this, as I sit with folks, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group like this, I'm going to be the translator of emotion. I'm going to feel things, I'm going to hear things, I'm going to smell things, I'm going to taste things. Everything that I experience comes through to illustrate the person that is there with you. Everybody has people with them. 
Now, how they come through and how they all figure it out, I don't know, but we're going to bounce around this theater like a wild man. Actually, Isaac's going to be bouncing around the theater like a wild man. He's got the mic, and this is going to turn into an interactive evening here pretty shortly. But what I want everybody to know is that when I get connected to you, there is no judgment. There's no judgment. Our spirits want nothing but our health, our happiness, our joy, our abundance. The worst thing that's going to happen here is a little bit of tough love. And I know that people here are familiar with that. And I do have to find myself in the position of dropping what somebody referred to the other day as a truth bomb. That's what's going to happen here. Now, what happens with group readings like this, whether it's a few hundred people or whether it's a handful of people, I'm going to be guided to certain individuals in this theater. And I'm going to have messages for them. Now, one of the things that happens is that if I'm talking to this fine woman right here and I'm giving her messages, it actually might be for this person right there. Now, what I've found is that in a group like this, I am guided to bring messages that are universal to everybody. So if I don't call on you, just know that I am available for one-on-one -on -one sessions at my studio in Littleton. I do group readings for families, businesses, all of that. But I want everybody here to listen to the stories. I want you to listen to my story because my story, it's weird. But it's one where I listen to my intuitions, I listen to my dreams, I listen to my messages, and I was led. I had to participate. I had to ask the guy out, you know what I mean? I had to do that stuff or those things wouldn't have been any use to me. So I want everybody here to take a little bit of inspiration from my story. I want everybody here to take inspiration from the other stories and the circumstances that we are sharing in. Now, an interesting thing is that a lot of people will come to these events hoping to hear from certain individuals. And again, I have no control over that. No control. But I will say, if you had a grandparent or an ancestor like my grandmother, and she had to come through a guy like me to bring me a message to straighten me out, she would not care if I was in front of 300 people. So we might have the very shy folks. We might have the very aggressive folks. But all I know is that all the messages and everybody that I get connected to comes through from a place of love, grace, and compassion. That's it. So no judgment. And when folks get connected to me, you might feel a little on the spot. So we're going to call it the hot seat. But just remember, if I get guided to you, it's because you have shoulders broad enough to hear the message, and everybody else in this room are going to benefit from that message. The other thing that I should tell you is that this event's being filmed. If you're not where you're supposed to be, or not with who you're supposed to be with, <laughs> you might want to duck out of this, okay? Just a heads up. Just a heads up. All right. Now, here's, here's a funny thing, and this is how it's going to work, because we're going to get into it here. Isaac's got the mic. He's got a microphone, and we are going to run around this theater. He's got an aisle blocked off up there. He's going to be wandering around, and I'm going to be guided to certain individuals. Now, those people are going to get really hot. They're going to feel on the spot. But those are messages that I am supposed to bring. So if you get uncomfortable, just look at my beautiful husband. That's what he's there for. <laughs> he's also got a present for you. I have this really weird thing with four-leaf clovers. I find hundreds of them, and I turn them into charms. If you come to see me one-on-one, -on -one, I'll give you a charm of a four-leaf clover. Everybody who I get guided to this evening is going to get a four-leaf clover charm. Everybody. So if he comes up to you, he's going to give you this once he's done with our time together. Now, if there's anything else that I have to remember as I get into this, I'm going to interject it along the way. There are a lot of principles. There are a lot of guidelines, a lot of things that spirit wants us to know. We're going to pick up on them over the course of the evening. I just want everybody to remember one way mirror that you would see in a cop show. They're about to come through. Now, Here's some strangeness. We're gonna, get, we're gonna dial right into the strangeness. And Isaac, are you ready? All right, he's ready, all right. So, last week, a couple weeks ago, 
I was here with Chad because I wanted to get the feeling of the stage, wanted to get the feeling of this place. This is the first time I've actually been up on a stage with folks. I've done big group readings with a few hundred people, but I've always been on the floor with them. It was a little weird being up here. So we might have to deal with the mechanics of that. But when I was here with Chad and Dave, and Dave was showing us around, I said to him, I'm like, wow, I know that when I have this session, that there's going to be a woman sitting right down here in this corner. And you can ask him. I had to say this to him. I said this to him. I've said this to Dave. And I've said this to Isaac. I go, I don't know how it's going to work. You can start coming on down here, Isaac, please. I said, I don't know how it's going to work, but I do know that there's going to be somebody who's going to sit right here that I'm going to have to talk to. And she said, she's sitting right here. Hello. Hi. I'm going to ask if it's OK if you could stand up, please. And I am going to grab a sip of my tea. Could I have your name, please? Tammy. Tammy, so let's just get it right out of the way. I didn't want you to sit here. <laughs> I didn't ask you to sit here. You sat here of your own volition. Yeah, I followed them. You followed them. <laughs> OK. Here's, here's what's interesting. As I was saying to Chad, I was like, wow, just before this started, I was like, wow, all right, I'm, I need somebody who's got like big poofy hair, gray poofy hair, sitting right here in the center. And Tammy, you, got have, it. you got it. Okay. So here's an interesting thing because the message that I have for you is this, okay? So I want to, I want to illustrate to you the, the man and spirit that's around you. And I seem to get a lot of men, they seem to be very forceful during group readings. And a man, it's funny. Very similar looking to you. Very similar looking to you. He's got a love of life. He would have been quiet. He would not have wanted to been around a lot of people. Loves you very much. And this is interesting because, and one of the things that people need to know, I get father, brother, husband, energy mixed up because it's very powerful, very protective, loving, masculine energy. I got a man here who feels like, oh, big daddy. Like a big, big daddy energy. Big daddy energy. And it's interesting because um, he, he says that you're a rock star. And whatever you do, he's very proud of you and what you do. Now, one of the fascinating things is that I'm not sure if this is you, but I felt like this woman who was going to be sitting here had something to do with like the administration of a school, okay? Are you, are you in that position at all? No. No. Well, okay. I, it's are not you in administration, it's human services. Human services, where you're helping out kids and stuff? Yes, yeah. they do help okay. kids. Yeah. So that's very much what it felt like. I was like, okay, so there's going to be a woman here, administration, school, what have you. Now, what's fascinating is that you're just like me, Tammy, and that you come from people who honored hard work. Mm -hmm. We're going to work hard. We're going to get up every day, and we're going to go to work. Sometimes to our detriment. Sometimes we can get taught to work too hard. And that's what we have to... We have to be mindful. The weight of the world is on your shoulders. You're sitting here this evening as an example for everybody in this theater, as an example of this mantra. I have a mantra or a saying that I like to live by. I try to do my best, and I want to see if you can accomplish this. This guy says it's going to be against your nature to do this. Okay, He's very, he's very indicative of that. Yeah, it, I can tell the theater, and I can tell you, you're probably not going to listen to me. You're just like your mother, he says. That's fascinating. Okay. Stubborn. You're a stubborn lady. Okay. <laughs> Set in your ways, dig your heels in. Can I ask you, are you a Taurus? Yes. Ha! He's a Taurus. Raise your hand, kiddo. He's a Taurus, too. <laughs> if you're a Taurus, raise your hands. Yeah, there we are. Dig those heels in. That's what we love. All right, so you get this stubborn energy, right? The weight of the world is on your shoulders. Here's the mantra. Serve ourself, not at the expense of others. Serve others, not at the expense of ourself. You wouldn't hurt a fly. You don't hurt anybody. You help everybody, but you do so at your own expense. You do. You do so at your own expense. Now, this is funny because this guy's energy is like, I wouldn't. He's like, I wouldn't. So this guy, I'm not saying that he's selfish, right? He's not selfish. This guy is a person who's very much aware of sustainability. I think that you're just very much sort of 
You're kind of like my mom, and I'm going to pick on her a little bit in the way that my mom is sort of a cliched American woman. She expects the most out of herself. She gives herself the least, and then she gets pissed off at herself because she gets angry and tired. So, I mean, you guys should have jerseys. God damn it. For, <laughs> but I, I need you, and this is interesting because he's bringing my attention to your feet, your ankles, your knees. You need to take care of them very much, very, very much. He says you're fragile like porcelain, okay. Um, do you have a son? Uh, multiple, yeah. Multiple, okay. What's fascinating is that this is um, this energy of you working hard. It's like what my mother did over the course of her life. Work hard, work hard, work hard. And I think what that is, is that's an example of kids do what we show them, not what we tell them, mm -hmm. right? So I can tell my kiddo, and I tell him as often as I can, work hard, play hard. Don't work too hard. Don't play too hard. Try to maintain those things in balance so we can stay sane. Woman, you're not sane. <laughs> Love you, but you're not sane. And there's this badge of honor, this like, I've got to fight, I've got to fight. You're just very, very geared towards this mission. So I want you to go home and I want you to look up the definition of martyr so you don't become one, so you don't sacrifice yourself, your well being. And I don't mean to be scary, I don't mean to be scary. Take care of yourself so you don't prematurely end up over on the other side of this mirror with this man. Okay? Now, he says that you need to speak up. Your throat is blocked in the way, not right now, but I need you to speak up, okay? Now, can I ask you, did this man wear suspenders? <laughs> yes, on he did. occasion. On occasion, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just, he's just a lover of life. He's a lover of life. And I'll tell you something, what a smell to walk into this theater and to smell popcorn in a theater. It's not like popcorn at home. There's only a certain smell that popcorn gets. And he's interesting because he says he's like watching you and eating popcorn. So again, I want you to see that we are very much the heroes of their stories. They carry on. This is funny. He shows me, he's like, it's nothing fancy. He just wants you to know that he's sitting on a stump, like a stump mm -hmm. in a forest, right? Like just a stump. He's just sitting there, happy as a clam, watching you. He just knows that you're a little out of balance. And again, there's, this not judge, there's no judgment here, right? You're just overextended, overworked. And he says that you're gritting your teeth. You're at your teeth? Got that energy? Like, I probably do and don't realize it. Frustrated? Often. Often, okay. So I have a question for you, okay? We're just going to refer to this guy as Big Daddy, okay? Big Daddy. When you get frustrated and you're dealing with somebody who you'd like, and he indicates that you'd like to throttle them, so there's a little like, I'm going to choke him a little bit. When you get really frustrated with people, I want you to imagine what would Big Daddy do? Do you know what I mean? What would he do with those people? How would he interact with them? How would he care to interact with them? Would he just leave them alone and let them fall on their faces? This is, this is, this is fascinating because there is that energy of learning lessons as we fall on our faces. Um, and this isn't your clients, this is your children, okay? So just to be very much specific that you can't save them from themselves, you can't save them from their lives. You can help them, you can guide them, you can nurture them, but sometimes we gotta wear the egg on our face and learn the hard lessons sometimes. Uh, this guy really wants to mess with you. Like, seriously, seriously. So I'm going to pass you this message, right? Because this is like, this is this guy. He just wants to play. He wants, he's, he's a joker, okay? He, uh, they tell me to tell people things, and they're absolutely ridiculous. And I'm going to tell you this absolutely ridiculous thing. He says you need to get a parrot, <laughs> like a macaw, like a toucan, something like that. Do you have a history with birds? Do I? Yeah. Uh, when I was little. You like birds when you were little like that in my, cages and stuff? My, um, my brothers had parakeets, and they used to let them loose in the house and scare my mom. Ah, I guess you guess. not a bird fan. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock, the birds, yeah. So it's interesting that this guy wants you, and, and, and what, what's fascinating about this is, is it's the, and I'm not a big fan of like putting fish in tanks and birds in cages and all this. This is very much the color and the sounds to delight you, that sort of thing. Um, 
he wants you to watch what feels like, and this could be a different, different cartoon, it feels like Huckleberry Hound. <laughs> he wants you to sit down, and it's like he wants you to watch cartoons that he watched with you. Did you watch cartoons with him? Uh, yeah, the old Looney Tunes. The old Looney Tunes? Okay, so it's not the Hanna-Barbera stuff, but it's the old Looney Tunes, right? Okay, um, and he says, <sighs> he just really wants a burger. <laughs> burger, like a big, fat, juicy, Burger. Do you remember him loving those? Oh, yeah. Grilled. Grilled yeah. burger. Yeah, burger, right? Um, he says that you have difficulty saying what you need to say to people that are closest to you. And it's going to be really useful if you can figure out how to do that. And th that doesn't mean be mean or be harsh, because when you say the difficult things that are closest to the people that are closest to you, you're showing other people how to say those things with grace and skill <coughs> as well. So this is very much, I think one of, the, one of the greatest skills that we can have as an adult is just being able to say, I'm not comfortable with that. But I'm not comfortable with that to anybody, right? And it's important that you say that to the people that are closest to you. So those people that are closest to you know that it's okay to say it to their people that are closest to them. Because sometimes, you know, we're gonna be in relationships with people and things aren't gonna be copacetic all the time. This guy says, um, He's very happy with the work that you've done to your house. This is interesting. Very happy with the work that you've done to your house. Um, he wants you to fix the path, the walkway up the center, because it feels like it's broken stone. Do you have a path that needs to be fixed? He doesn't want you tripping. Oh, it's, yeah, we have a crumbling asphalt driveway. Crumbling asphalt driveway, okay. So it must be crumbling enough where you could twist your ankle, something like that. I push wheelchairs up and down it. Ah, okay. So, very important for you to have that walkway. Uh, he's indicating to me that you have neck problems. You have neck problems. So, neck, shoulder problems, those sorts of things. Would you ever consider acupuncture, acupressure, anything like those? Uh, yes. Try it for me. Try, find a good one, you know, a well-established, recommended one. Um, We have certain spirits in our lives that will play tricks on us, that will play jokes on us. And this guy, he's indicating to me, like, it feels like he's tickling your feet and he wants to mess with you. Okay. Why do they do that? Why do they show themselves so incessantly in this very joking way? They want us to know that they're there. They want us to know that they're there. He says that you feel very alone. So I don't want you to feel alone, and I want you to get into a healthy conversation with this man, okay? Now, this guy's showing me an old pickup truck. Like, he wants to be in an old pickup truck, and he just wants to, like, I'm smelling the gas and the old exhaust and the bup, 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 bup of the old pickup truck. It's like, if you have anything like that, you should go on a drive and talk to him. But I want you to talk to him, please. Do you have an old pickup truck, or did you ride in one with him? I have a 2008 that was his truck. That was his truck, okay. So I want you to get in that truck, drive it around, and I want you to talk to him. It is very important that we're on an ongoing relationship with our spirits. We should talk to them all the time. They're sending us messages, so we should talk to them. We just shouldn't do it in the grocery store, okay? <laughs> so thank you for showing up tonight. I know that it was hard for you to be here, but this is good, this is good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So Chad, there's our, there's our woman who sat right there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, now, Isaac, what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you go up here to the woman in the tan. Yes, you. <laughs> oh boy, here we go, all right, here we are. Can I get your name, please? Jeannie. Jeannie, okay. So Jeannie, all right, um, this is funny, so you, you you're a sleeper is what they say. And what I mean by that, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're a sleeper. 10 hours a day. <laughs> Never have a problem falling asleep. It's a family tradition. <laughs> it is. You sleep in the coats. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Now, they, okay. So, it feels like we're gonna get a lot of really funny guys tonight, okay? Funny, funny guys, there's funny guys, and it feels like there's three of them around you. Three funny men around you. And um, they're showing me as to be like Elmer Fudd, almost. 
Oh, Elmer Fudd guys. They're really funny, and they're having a good time with you. Now, they say, um, are you frustrated with your neighbors? Not anymore. Did you put them to sleep? <laughs> okay. So a, a, a frustration with the energies of the people around you, whether it's an apartment or neighbors or what have you, what they want for you is they want you to get more house plants. Okay? More house plants. And what's fascinating to me is that, and I don't know why they're showing this to me, but they're going to show it to me. We're looking at trees, like little trees with thick stalks that are about this big. I know it's a particular type of house plant. But it's funny, what they say is that you should be trying to replicate the forests of the Pacific Northwest in your home. You got anything for big trees? I need a 12-step program for plants. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, get more. We're okay. Gonna, we're gonna get more. Okay. Now, why they would talk about that is because apparently those plants are gonna help you with the energy of the people that you're living around. A buffer, if you will, to their energy, to their noise, what have you. And also, who's it gonna piss off? They say it's gonna piss somebody off. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Not you, <laughs> but this is that energy of these guys. They wanna, they wanna piss somebody off. This is funny. Yeah, I can see that. You can see it. Yeah. All right, so you're living with somebody who is gonna be, uh, no, we have, enough, we have enough plants, or there's? No, n no, there's nobody else, but um, yeah, I don't know, maybe the lawn guy, I don't know. Mm, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hear me out on this. Uh, oh my gosh, was your mother frugal? Yes. <laughs> That's who they're trying to piss off. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> they're trying to get you to spend your money on unnecessary things. <laughs> Okay, and, and can I ask, is your mom still here? No. She's not, okay. So these men are in spirit trying to get your mother mad. So now, seriously, if, if some more houseplants in your house get your mother upset, she's still got some work in spirit to do, okay? It's just plants. Now, whoo, she just comes through. Hold on, hold on, hold on. She's like, the plants that you need, very much herbs, She's talking about herbs in the kitchen, herbs, plants, all of that. If you're going to get plants and herbs, do something with them other than just look at them. Okay? <laughs> That's what she says. Do something with them other than just look at them. All right. And this is interesting because she says she's still chasing this guy in the world of spirit. So hold on. So they're, they're running around. She's chasing him. So they're, they're having a good time, apparently. Um, this man always messed with her. Always mess with her. So now they're in spirit. And he wants to mess with her. So it's just really a lush, really strong presence around you. Um, this guy wants you to put in, uh, and he would only say this because this was good for you or this is something that you wanted. He wants you to put in, um, he wants you to redo the flooring in your kitchen and do really nice square tile, like hard ceramic tile. So you need kitchen flooring done. Yes, I need a whole kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Start with the flooring, woman. Okay, Come gotcha. on now. <laughs> Go from the ground up, Thanks, right? <laughs> Go from the ground up. But it's fascinating because what they're showing me is 12 inch by 12 inch white square tiles. So this feels very clinical, almost very sterile, but it shouldn't be stone. It should be just like, it feels just like white. So again, that could be the way that they're showing this to me, or you have something for very clean kind of, uh, lack of a better word, sterile surface. So very much wants you to have it, okay? Um, do you have animals that are messing? Not messing, but could I have four cats. Could get messy? They gotta they, have hairballs or something, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, they're everywhere, they're yeah. Everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not the hairballs, but the animals. The but this is, this is interesting, because it's the type of flooring that will be good for animals. Okay. For pets. Okay. Um, in your home, can I ask you, do you have brick? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on, hold on. Is this an ancestral home? No. No? They just really like it. So this is a home for you. And they just like that this is sort of your castle? Yes. Feeling that? Okay. Um, shoulder, elbow injury? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
uh, fragile, and don't take this the wrong way, I'm not a medical provider, I don't provide medical advice. This guy says you're fragile like your mother, okay? Mm -hmm. So if your mother had any sort of osteoporosis, arthritis, bone stuff, it's gonna be in that shoulder, in that elbow injury, bringing my attention to your hands, like arthritic hands. You gotta be careful of the arthritis and all that, that sort of stuff. Um, this guy, he's very, very funny, very, very funny. Just shows me like, feels just like, it's like I'm gonna work on a tractor. Old guy with old hat, this is funny, really, really funny. He says, if you're gonna tell off so many people in your head, you might as well say it out loud. <laughs> I mean, what do you get to lose, right? So you're having this conversation in your head, he's hearing it, and he just would invite you to say it out loud, okay? Now, I gotta be really careful when I encourage you to do that because I don't want you to just go willy-nilly off, well, he, he does, actually, hold on. So this is, we're gonna take this with a grain of salt, okay? This is not how I'm gonna ask you to go out in life, but he really does want you to go tell people to go get stuffed, okay? <laughs> Truly. I'm down with that. Are you? Yes. Okay. I just don't want you to be like this woman over here who has, Tammy, who has difficulty saying the tough things of the people that are closest to them. Okay? So, again, if you have something to say and people need to hear it, say it. Say it. Don't attack them. Don't make them feel like less of a human. But if they need feedback, if you need to say something, say it. Because, interestingly enough, to whatever degree that you're holding it in, it's affecting your health. So you're holding it in and it's increasing your tension, increasing your stress. Doesn't like that. It says it's high time. High time the people around you get off their high horse. So you got some people around you on their high horse, huh? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I hope they're not here. <laughs> I'm kidding, they're in Concord. <laughs> It gets real weird doing these things, so. <laughs> Thank you for showing up. It's very important that you use your words, use your mouth. Now, it's fascinating because um, when I called you a sleeper, and you said, yeah, 10 hours a day, that's not exactly what I was talking about. Oh. What I was talking about is you're a sleeper in the way that you shoot from the hip. Nobody expects you to have these yeah. quips, right? Nobody expects you to be funny, but you are funny. That's what I meant when I said that you're a sleeper. <laughs> He also wants you to write poetry again. Oh. So you don't have any creative outlet. This is really important that part of the frustration, part of the stress that you're dealing with in this world is because you don't have this creative outlet. You got to write, write poetry, write this stuff down. And it's really funny because he's showing me like uh, what looks like old microfilm, uh, like old old microfilm, like pictures and stuff, wants you to get back into the pictures and the history and the stories. But it looks like those things that people would look like, like you know what microfiche is, microfilm, mm -hmm. like doosh, 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 that's real old stuff, right? So that's interesting, because he wants you to go back into like, he's showing me like the sepia-toned pictures, the colored, all that, that speaks to you, yeah? It does. Okay, so uh, here's a deep question for you. Are you bored? Or are you simply not entertaining yourself? Uh, sit with it. Sit with it, right? Sit with it, because if you ever find yourself bored, think about the poetry you could write, think about those pictures and the history that you can dig into, those things that you're probably just thinking about because they're with you all the time. So I really don't want you to get bored or frustrated with life. I want you to kind of dig into stuff that you haven't, okay? Show us who your inner 16-year-old is, he says, and go get the tattoo. <laughs> oh, okay. I just, I'm sorry, I just talked about that with someone yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, pulled it up, showed it to them. Go get it. I'm down. Go get it. Isaac, if you could give her one of those four-leaf clover charms, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. Next time I see you, I want to see a tattoo. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, so I'm getting called. I want you, if you could, Isaac, please go up to that row of four. Okay. 
I'm having a hard time. There's no men there, are there? No men in that row of four? Nope. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Go in front. Row down, please. Row down, okay. If you're in that row, raise your hand if you're a male. Please. Okay, one, two, three. It's the older, yeah, I know, you're hiding. I see you back there. The older man with a beard, please. I know, this one's for you. I know you're hiding, but <laughs> if you wouldn't mind standing up, please, and letting everybody know what your name is. Mike. Mike, okay. So, Mike, all right. Around you, and again, remember, I'm being kind of guided right to this person, and I got this message for you. May I ask you, are you a third, like Michael the third? No. No, okay. Did you know your father and his father? I did know them. You did know them, okay. So may I ask you, are you very much like the both of them? Probably not. <laughs> did you bring anybody here this evening? My wife. Your wife, okay. Could you have her stand up, please? I know, you came for the fun. Come on, stand on up, stand on up. Uh, Hi, Mike's wife. Could I get your name, please? Cindy. Cindy, okay. So I want to tell you about the men that are around you, okay? So this is the message that I have for you. So Mike, you feel like a person, and this is why I asked if you're a third. You got a very quiet man of integrity around you. Integrity. Integrity is important. You might not think it's important from the world of spirit, but integrity, as I know it, is defined as doing the right thing when nobody's looking. So you're a man of integrity. Now, what's fascinating is that whatever your last name is, you have men that are very much like you. Quiet, men of integrity. They have devoted their lives to the people around them. So Mike's wife, Cindy, you said? Cindy, could, you, could I ask you, has Mike been very much devoted to his family and the people around him? Yes. Okay. Can I ask you, did you know his father and his father's father to be men like that as well? I, that's okay if they weren't. I, I knew his father, and yes, he, he was like that, but I didn't know his grandfather. Okay, so there's a reason why, you know, and... As I said in the beginning, we all come from the bastards, the bandits, the bitches, you know, we all come from people that have questionable ethics, morals, what have you. Everybody does. But and the reason that I asked if you were a third, Mike, is because you, man, I'm telling you what, I have to relate to you. If I don't have any other message for you, I have this for you. You need to be proud of your life. You need to be proud of the people that you've raised. You need to be proud of what you've accomplished. And this is something else that I have to let you know. And this is why I share my story. The things that you're doing today and the things that you've done over the course of your life, you are going to see them play out a hundred years from now. Two hundred years from now. So you have kids, grandkids? We had a boy. He died. He passed away. Okay. Do you have other people that you guys have raised? Not really. Not really. Do you have friends, nephews, nieces, anybody like that in this world that have watched you? I have, I have five, five other brothers and sisters. You have five other brothers and sisters. Okay, so I have a question for you, and this is important. Do you know the people that you're going to leave everything to? And you don't need to even answer this, right? All I need you to know is that the things that you're seeing today and the things that you're doing, they're really going to play out years from now, truly. And the reason that I bring that up is because my mother, my father, their parents worked hard and they need to know that the things that they sacrificed, the things that they did are playing out years down the road. Now, what you've experienced, and I will take it down a notch here, the loss of a child is the hardest thing a human can go through. And I hate to quantify that. The loss of a spouse, the next hardest thing. The loss of our parents and anybody else that we've loved, very, very difficult. 
I can't tell you if I'm going to be able to bring him through. I'm not sure if that's even appropriate for a big crowd like this. Sometimes it's not that appropriate. But I will tell you, and I think if you've had a child and you've lost that child, that idea of posterity, the idea of heritage, if we don't have our children, our grandchildren to pass those things on to, I need you to know that as you have made your way through this world, and as you've been members of your community, whether or not you have instilled those values into children that are still living, you've instilled them into the people that are around you in the community, and to your friends, and to your nieces, your nephews, your brothers, your sisters. So I think that's very much why this message is very, very important, especially right now. I think it's safe to say that the both of you are in the last third of your life, so you're probably looking at what happens after that third is over. I really need you to know that these men of integrity are around you very much, letting you know that your sacrifices and everything that you've done have been very, very worth it. This is also an opportunity for me to let you know, I oftentimes get members of our beloved dead who have been dead longer who have been deceased longer, because it's like birth in reverse. Oftentimes, it's easier for somebody who's been passed for 20 years to come through versus somebody who's been passed for two. But again, this might not be appropriate to have in this crowd of people. Now, can I ask you, and Cindy, this is a question for you, okay? May I ask you, um, did you know anybody, or perhaps this is this person, um, I'm, I'm seeing a dirt bike. Do you know anybody with a dirt bike? Yes, our son had a dirt bike. Your son had a dirt bike, okay. So this is his way of coming through and saying hello, okay? So again, remember, as I do this, I'm drawn to where I'm drawn to, okay? Now, who this is coming through me with this dirt bike sees very much, and this is fascinating, because I would associate dirt bike with like a lot of like, heavy, fast energy, right? This person feels very gentle with a love of animals. Do you remember this person having a gentle soul and having a love of animals? Yes, definitely. Okay. Now may I ask you, Cindy, your mother, was she known for making jellies jams? Did you have anybody that made yeah. jellies or jams? Um, I'm not sure about jellies and, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. She, she did some, she did a lot of canning, but. I'm not sure if it was jellies or jams. Well, the jellies and jams is the way that spirit would say canning to me. That's kind of the symbol that they would use. Um, so this woman who would have done the canning very much just wants you to know that they're all taken care of over there. Okay? Now, what's really fascinating to me is that her message is that it's like she's got a bunch of them that she's taking care of. Not just this boy who liked a dirt bike, okay? Just like a bunch of them. So she's taking care of a bunch of people. And I need to ask you, she's relaying to me that she's watching, like, she's making popcorn. So like, like I'm feeding a bunch of people, like a bunch of kids who are watching TV or something. So can I ask you, did she have a bunch of grandkids that she watched, like, make popcorn for or something? What is this? Hi. Yeah, she made, she made popcorn for the kids, her kids. Well, this is just very much she's in the world of spirit, caring. Yeah. So it's really important for me just to let everybody know that in the world of spirit, they're very active. When we, when we pass away and we go to that other side of that one-way mirror, it's not like we just kick back. We're very active and we do things in terms of Lending insight, lending guidance, becoming very much that intuition for our loved ones. This woman's very much just like, I'm taking care of them all. Don't worry about it. I got them all. I got them all. It's very, very, very important for you to know that. Okay. Now, may I ask you, Cindy and Mike, thank you for holding the mic. Thank you, Mike, for holding the mic. Cindy, um, may I ask you, at what age did your son pass away? Well, let me 37, I believe. Okay, so thank you for that. Let me let me tell you this. 
it feels very much to me that this person had a long life, had a lot to heal from, just emotionally turmoil here, just had a lot to recover from. So this wasn't somebody who passed away at the age of 12. This is somebody who had lived a long enough life to accrue some trauma. One of the things that we experience as we move through the world of spirit is a healing of sorts. We see what happens to us. We see how things happen to us. And we heal from them because we get a higher perspective. Okay? Now, may I ask you, Cindy, and this is important for the both of you, and Isaac, I want you to give them both a four-leaf clover charm, please, before we're done here. Cindy, um, I don't like letters. I don't like acronyms in terms of mental illness or anything like this. I don't like ADHD. I don't like any of that stuff. But can I ask you, are you really neat? Are you really neat? Used to be. Used to be. Used okay. to be. <laughs> so those three letters that I'm looking at are OCD, OCD. Used Some people be. are very like mm, yeah, stringent. This guy's saying lighten up on Mike, please. <laughs> Mike, can you, can you relate to that, please? Oh, yes. You can. Okay. <laughs> now, what's fascinating, Mike, can I ask you, do you have a shop? I did, it had a wood shop. A wood shop, okay. Do you have anything like that now? I still have the shop. You still have the shop. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Stay out of there, he says. Cindy, don't go in the shop. Let him have his shop, okay? <laughs> now, if you want the kitchen to be neater, and Mike, make sure that you take off your muddy boots, please, okay? If you want the kitchen to be neater, say so. The kitchen's not his shop, right? right. But the kitchen isn't heaven. The kitchen doesn't have to be pristine all the time. This is funny because it's like, the energy that I get from this guy is like, ma, you rode my ass all the time. <laughs> Just in terms of keeping things neat, making beds, straightening things out, all of that, all of that, all of that. Life, you know, we got to be neat. We got to fight against the chaos, all of that. But he, he, he doesn't want you to use however many days you have left to uh, just be uptight when you don't need to be. And that's hard for me to say that because I don't want to call anybody uptight. But this is just, you know, you got a few grains of sand left in your hourglass. Everybody does have a certain amount of days left on this planet. I don't want you to spend those days being really uptight over stuff that doesn't matter, or doesn't matter to a great degree, okay? Now, uh, Mike, can I ask you, do you drink coffee? Yes. Okay. Would it kill you to go half-calf? <laughs> Probably not. All right. Now... <laughs> Would it kill you to possibly read the news instead of watching it? I'm not a reader. <laughs> Could you listen to it, maybe, instead of watching it? Now, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a medical provider. I don't provide medical advice, but I am getting drawn to your ticker, okay? So, caffeine, lots of caffeine, not really great for that. Stress of news, not really great for that. And this isn't me saying you're going to have a heart attack and kick the bucket. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying that the stress that you're going through, to whatever degree, is having an effect on your physiological self. And this is important. Now, can I ask you, Mike, are you aware of heart problems through your father's side? I'm not sure how my grandfather died. Okay. Can I just ask you, everything good right here? You're good? Everything's looking good? Everything's feeling good? Come on, man. To a degree. We want you around for a really long time. To a degree. Okay. So, Cindy, this is what I need you to do, please. Sneak the decaf in slowly. <laughs> slowly sneak that decaf in, please. Okay? I, I make the coffee in the morning. Ah, God damn it. <laughs> of course you do, Mike. Of course you do. Okay. <laughs> So what else I'd like you to do, too, all right? Now, Cindy, do you have pets? No. No? No. Okay. I want you to get some. <laughs> now, here's an interesting thing, all right? It feels like you could use maybe a Shih Tzu, maybe a pug, something like that, something small. No. Now, I want you to consider something, please. They really like the idea of Mike going, God damn animals, God damn animals that sort of energy. 
Because there is a, I want, my grandmother lived until she was 87 because she ran on piss and vinegar. They want the piss and vinegar in Mike's veins, they just don't want the coffee, okay? <laughs> they want him to have that thing to get passionate about or get a little, you know, a little low-lying stress is okay. Watching the news, not okay, Mike. I think it's having an effect on you. So can I, can I ask you, and this is a fair question for everybody, do you get a little amped up when the news comes on? You do? Okay. Yeah. So this is an opportunity, and again, I don't care if you're right, left, center, otherwise, it does not matter. What I can guarantee you is that today's media, right, left, or center, is not the media of Walter Cronkite. It's not. Every single TV station, every single mass media news outlet is getting people addicted to fear, so people are addicted to the commercials. That's it, it's a bottom line thing. I want you to be careful of emotional manipulation via the news, truly. Walter Cronkite would tell you the news and then let you decide how to feel about it. Any news station now is telling you how to feel and then giving you the news. Truly, it is. So I want you to be mindful of that because our spirits are masters of practicality. They are. <laughs> Can you do anything about it? If you can't do anything about it, don't sweat it. And truly, and then we're about to walk into this presidential cycle, I'm telling you, Spirits, when it comes to the presidential election, are very much vote and shut up. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, vote. Do what you can do. Put your hands on it and then take your efforts and bring them to your community. As I'll tell you, it is incredibly frustrating for the world of spirit for people to get all caught up about the presidential election, but they can't name their own state rep truly happens all the time. And I'm not saying that you're one of those people, I just want you to know that right now it's vital that you pay attention to your heart health, your emotional health, your stress, and you don't let those talking heads get under your skin. It's vital that you don't let those talking heads get under your skin because they're just trying to make money off of you. And I think that's just gonna frustrate you more. For me to give it to you in that perspective, I want you to think of public radio, AM radio, something like that where you can listen to it instead of finding yourself emotionally manipulated by the talking heads that are on that idiot box. That's just really, really good advice. Now, I believe this is a message from your son for you, Mike. And again, this is to entice you to see this long life ahead of you. He wants you to get a tattoo. I don't believe in them. That's why he wants you to get them. He was covered with them. He was covered with them? Well, yeah, I am too. So here's, here's something for you to consider, right? Here's something for you to consider. Tattoos are very ritualistic, very ceremonial. And because we lack the ceremony around losing people, well, it's useful for us to get a tattoo in commemoration because then we can become somebody else. And this is interesting because he's showing me like a dirt bike tattoo. Maybe just consider a little 25 cent piece one like a $50 shop minimum, something like that. I know you don't believe in them, but I can guarantee you, just like everybody else in this room, you're not taking that with you. So take it, as a, take it with a grain of salt, but this is what I need you to know. Um, very, very appreciative of you and the way that you commemorate memories. May I ask you, do you have a flag in a case? Um, well, we did it one time, but I gave it to my brother. Okay, so the, you know what I'm talking about, like the flag in the box and, yep. and all of that. Now, Mike, in your home or even in your heart, in the way that you have things on the wall, all of that, do you commemorate memories? And this is a question for you, Mike. Well, we have pictures on the wall. Are these your pictures? There's a few of mine. Okay, so very, very important for you to lean into that in the way of creating that space as a living altar, if you will, a living memorial to all of your people. Um, and this is a message from Mike, not for Cindy. Mike, I wanna ask you, uh, are they coming through to you in your dreams? You're seeing people in your dreams? Has that ever happened to you? It has, it has with the boy. Okay. Now this is important because I want to talk to you and this is an example for everybody here in this room to see that this happens. We get up and go to the bathroom, generally speaking around three o'clock and then we go back to bed. 
get up, go to the bathroom around three, go back to bed. That space between that 3 a.m. bathroom break and dawn, those dreams are actual spirit visitations. Something about that time of day, something about the way our mind works, that's when those spirits will come in. And I want you to, I want you to just trust that and know that that wasn't just your mind playing tricks on you, that they are coming through to say hello. And can I ask you, did he smoke and did that smell drive you crazy? Oh, he smoked. Yeah. And did it drive you crazy? Especially, the smell of it? Oh, yeah. Especially with the pot. Ah! There we go. All right. Welcome to the North Country. Welcome to the North Country. All right. So that's exactly, that's exactly what he's saying. Because it's like this guy wants to play a trick on you. Okay? Wants to play a trick on you just by like playing that little trick. All right? Now, Cindy, here's an important message from him for you. You made Christmas very, very special. So you had a thing about Christmas. You just made it absolutely the most special time in the world, right? Right. Okay. Now, it's fascinating because he's like, well, you went a little heavy on the birthdays, so you embarrassed him on his birthdays? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you embarrassed him on his birthdays. So you must have made a big deal yep. of things and all of that. Now, here's something that I need the both of you to know, and this is vital because the fact that you're here... I have to lend you both as an example to everybody here, and here's why. Going to get a little heavy, and this is really important for everybody to know, because this is going to be an example of how everybody should carry on in this world. When we lose our people, children, spouses, husbands, wives, it doesn't matter. It is the most difficult thing that we will experience, absolutely. Now, I want everybody in this room to imagine what it's like when we pass away. So I'm going to give you the basics here. When we pass away, it's like falling. It's like falling right through the floor. It's like being caught by our family that's over there. Now, again, this is a little heavy. Whether we grow up in a church or not, we get the idea of hell shoved down our throat. Lake of fire, burn for all eternity. Do as they say, or you're going to the lake of fire. That is a bunch of malarkey. There is no lake of fire where we burn for all eternity because we didn't get baptized. Malarkey. I do want to talk to you about hell, though. And this is important for everybody to understand. And again, I want to set you two as an example of why I'm bringing this up. Hell is not a lake of fire where we burn for all eternity Hell is regret. Can I prove it? Allow me to finish. Hell is regret. And what I mean by that is this. When we pass away, we go to that other side of that one-way mirror. And this is why every major world religion says, don't take your own life. Don't take your own life. You go to hell. And it's not that we're going to go to hell. That's not what happens. When we take our own life, whether intentionally or unintentionally, when we take our own life, we don't poof out of existence. We go to the other side of that one-way mirror. And then we watch our loved ones. And we watch our loved ones suffer with what that action caused for pain. That, that's not a good time. And being directly in touch with our loved one's pain, that causes us pain. Now, the reason that I have to bring this up is because in the both, in your way, in the both of what you guys have done, you guys have carried on. And you have found peace to whatever degree you have found peace. And this is vital because so many people in this world cling to grief like it's a badge of honor. Like, oh my gosh, mom, dad, gram, gramp, look at how much I hurt. It's a testament to my love for you. That's not what they want. That's not what you would want for them if your positions were reversed. Grief is the opposite or the other side of love. Whenever we love, we're going to grieve. 
Whenever we love, we're going to lose. Whenever we live, we're going to die. Whenever we're healthy, we're going to pass away. The way that the two of you have carried on in the face of the worst thing that has happened to you and to humans in general, that is a gift. That is a gift. And I need you two to know that you are an example for others to follow. Now, I'll give you an example. I am, knock on wood, lucky enough to say that the only person I've ever had a chance to love that has gone to death is my grandmother. My grandmother lived until she was 87, and that woman lost her mother when she was five. She buried two of her sons. She buried her father. She buried her husband. My grandmother went through the worst things a human can go through at the age of five. She suffered more in the first five years of her life than I have in my whole 44. And if there's anything that I can do to make sure that she doesn't suffer, I'm going to do it. And the only way that I can make sure she doesn't suffer as she watches me is to reduce my own. If I want my grandmother to rest in peace, I have to live in peace. If I want my parents that are still alive to be at peace, I have to live in peace. I can't be... Well, I could, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to be suffering because I want my son, my husband, my parents, my loved ones to not suffer. This is very much a gift that you have given him in the way that you have worked through it. And I can't say that you've worked all the way through it. I don't even know if that's possible. But I can say, to a great degree, I believe that the two of you no longer blame yourselves. And this is vital because that's not what they want. That's not what any of our spirits want. That's not what our parents want, our grandparents want. They want from that other side of this mirror to watch us, to know joy, to know peace. Now, one of the things that I'd like you to do this fall, and this is a fall thing, not a, not a right now thing, I need, the, I need you guys to plant garlic, okay? This is a weird message. So again, Mike, this is for you, please. Mike, can I ask you, do you know if your cholesterol levels are a little high? No, they never really have been. Never really have been. Do you like garlic? No. Do you like garlic, Cindy? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit? All right. I want you to think about what garlic is good for, just antifungal, antibacterial, that sort of thing. Now, may I ask you, um, you guys have an old horse manure pit? Used to. <laughs> old horse manure pit. Yeah. This is funny. Plant it in the old horse manure pit, if you could, please. Or get some of the old horse manure and put it wherever you'd plant the garlic, okay? Now, Cindy, it's not too late for you, please, to plant sunflowers. I want you to consider planting sunflowers. And what's fascinating to me, too, is that uh, this woman around you very much wants you to feed the birds... So it's very much around planting the sunflower. So the sunflowers feed the birds, okay? So you know how they do that, right? Yep. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, you guys are wonderful. And whether you believe it or not, you both are an example as to what a relationship should be. Devoted, patient. I mean, I could give you the Bible verse, right? Love is patient, love is kind, all of that. You guys are very much that. Thank you for coming this evening. Now, Isaac, if you would give them both a four-leaf clover charm, please. So if you could, please. Oh, we're going to have fun now. Here we go. On the other side... I see, a, I see like three gray shirts, two females, maybe shorter hair. Gray sweatshirts on the edge of the aisle. Raise your, there we go. Perfect. perfect, 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 perfect. That's you. All right. Can I get your name, please? Colleen. Colleen. Okay, here we go. So Colleen, I can barely see you from here. All right. Um, so the woman that I have around you, and this is, this is funny, the woman that I have around you is very much, um, the first word that comes to mind is perfectionist. 
perfectionist, very much particular, very much would have wanted things her way, um, very much would have, this is fascinating, very much would have had an idea of how other people should have carried on in their lives, but what she's indicating to me is that she was quiet about it. She didn't want to judge people. She didn't want to be too in their faces. She didn't want to be any of that. But she had, she had a distinct sense of observation and a distinct sense of standards, integrity. Um, interestingly enough, she says that she wishes she had talked more about this when she was alive. Not from a place of the fact that it's not like, you know, her descendants don't have integrity. What it is is that this is very much that I wish I could say something or I wish I had said it and never needed to have said it versus not saying it and then wish I had said it. She really wants you to know, um, to take a page out of her book, okay? And what it really feels like is this woman who is coming through very strongly uh, as your mother, if not your mother, your grandmother, she very much wants to say to you, you're not a disappointment. So this is very much this person who knows that you have high standards and that you have questions about why or how or what if you'd fallen short or if anybody had fallen short. Let me tell you the standards that spirit has for us from what I have done. I'm going to share the way spirit divides us into three groups of people. The first group of people in this world, very much the worst group, and as we are humans, there's always going to be a section of humanity that's the worst. The worst section of humanity are the people that hurt intentionally. They want to create pain. They want to hurt. They just want to do all the awful things for whatever programs or conditionings. The second group of people are the best than most of us. The second group of people are the people that do the best they can with what they have. And somewhere along the way, they make a decision that messes some things up. And they might hurt somebody or cause problems for their loved ones. The third group, excuse me, is the best. The third group are the people who try to create a better place. Now, I believe 90% of your days you have been group number three, trying to do your damnedest with what you got, you know. Your darkest days, you did the best you could with the limited amount of experience and wisdom you had at the moment, and you made a decision that might have messed up. But other than that, you need to know that you never hurt anybody. Now, this woman is very, very excited because this feels like you have her picture in your home. Do you? I do. Yeah. You do. Like, in a place of honor. Now, can I ask you, this place of honor, do you walk by and you talk to her? Once in a while. Okay. I look up because there's, there's a clock that I gave her. It was a bird clock, and her picture's above the bird clock. So a place of honor yeah. above the bird clock. All right. So this is, in, this is interesting because as people would watch her, right, like people would observe her and watch her, it's like... It's like she knew people thought she was in, like a stuffy fuddy-duddy, but it's funny because she had like, she had a spirit. She had like a sense of humor. And what's really interesting is that she would use that to her own advantage. So it's like this old lady who got to be an old lady who then knew that people were thinking that she was slower or not capable and she was very astute. This is fascinating. She says that uh, in the very same way, you are that way that people will look at you and assume things of you, assume that you're a certain caliber, of a certain astuteness, and she, she wants you to use that to your advantage, that if anybody is to insult you or treat you like you're stupid, she very much wants you, very much wants you, to use that to your advantage so you can just make your life a better place. Okay? Now... <sighs> This is, this, is, this, is, this is really tough because you're carrying a lot of weight in your heart. Like, life stuff. Just life, 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 life. Everybody carries a lot of weight. She's just really needing you to know that you've not done anything wrong. So whatever you've got going on in your life, whatever sort of, like, turmoil, uh, family member suffering, whatever's going on in your life, I need you to be really fair to yourself and see that you're not the cause of it. 
And just in the same way that she wishes she had spoke up more, you're here, you can speak up more, but, and this is really important, if you raise your mouth to the people that you love and they don't listen to you, it's not because your message isn't worth it, it's not th that they don't care about it, it's just that they're, on s they're stuck in their own stuff. They're leading their own lives. This is really, really important. Um, this woman also feels like she would have withheld affection and withheld uh, what I call positive affirmation. Like she just would not have told you that you'd done a good job. She wants to take this opportunity to let you know you have done an amazing job. Now, do you have grandkids? Yes. All right. Are you incredibly proud of them? Yes. All right. You got a little, uh, little man, a little hellion on like a skateboard? Okay, you got any little boys? No. All right, any tom girls? Um, tom boys, tom girls? Um, is Braley a tom girl? Braley, yeah. All right. My granddaughter. All right, this is just very much like, could you always make sure that that person's wearing their pads? So is this somebody that's like a bike age? No, well, she's bike age, but. So this is, again, the way that I receive things could be very literal, could be very figurative. Yeah. So. If you have a reckless grandchild, I want you to put all the pieces here together for me, right? If you have a reckless little wild crazy grandchild, right? I want you to bring your influence to bear on that person, okay? And I don't want you to feel like you're upsetting them. Now, I very much am grateful that my mother finds it in her to give my son a good here to what for, because he needs that. I could give it to him, his mother could give it to him, all the other people in this world could give it, but I'll tell you, there's no message like that, like the one from a grandmother, yeah. okay? So again, I want you to kind of get out of your own way a little bit in terms of being afraid of upsetting the apple cart. This woman wants you to upset the apple cart in a way that she regrets that she didn't upset her apple cart more, yeah. okay? So uh, here's a really important question that I have to ask you, and this is gonna give you a different, different way for you to see yourself, please. If you had a daughter who was born into your life, born into your birthday, born into your life, went through everything that you've gone through, and in spite of that, turned her life into what you've turned it into, would you be proud of her? Yes. All right. That's where I need you to get for yourself, please. Because we can often, most of us, define ourselves by our worst mistakes. And when really, if we never meant to hurt anybody, what mistakes have we made? Truly. You've never meant to hurt anybody. You should be proud of who you are. You should be proud of your people. You should be proud of your family and understand that sometimes life can get a little chaotic. That's out of your control. That was nothing that you did. This woman is very much about absolving you from any self-perceived sort of guilt or heartache, especially if you would never want anybody in your position to feel that had they suffered through what you've suffered through. So what I need you to do for me, please, is when you are kinder to yourself, I need you to see that you're being kinder to your mother's daughter. In the same way that I'm kinder to myself, I am kind to my grandmother's grandson. Okay? So thank you for showing up this evening. Now, interestingly enough, please mind your lower back, okay? Do you have any lower back stuff? It aches if I bend over just a little bit because I work like sometimes just, just bending ever so slightly. But I put the heating pad on and that works. Okay. Yeah. Please, please, yeah. please take care of that. Now, Isaac, if you could please give her a four-leaf clover charm. Thank you for that. If you could come up here, Isaac, please. One, two, three, four. Four on the edge. Blue jeans, please. Yes. The gentleman right here? Or nope. She oh. stood up. She stood up. Okay. Perfect. Hi. Hi. Can I get your name? Molly. Molly. Okay. Molly, you came with somebody today? My husband. Or are you just sitting real close to this guy? I'm just sitting close to him. Okay. Sitting. Okay. Here we are. Um, could I get your husband's name? Brian. Brian. Okay. So Brian, I have some questions about Molly, but this is gonna probably be more for you. 
okay? Now, uh, you know, a lot of people would probably assume that you're one-dimensional, Molly, but you're not. You got a lot going on, very deep, got a lot going on. It's almost like, could I ask you, are you a water sign, like a Pisces or something? No. What are you? Sag. Sag? Okay. So it really feels like you got a lot of emotions that you're dealing with all the time, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we all do, generally speaking, most of us got a lot of emotions, but this is what I want you to see. Brian, you're not going to like me saying this, and I'm going to have to say it. Molly, you're the gold standard, okay? And what I get for you is this. You have this innate perfectionism. Got to get everything right. Got to do everything right. Got to get everything right. Got to do everything right. Now, also, on top of that, you come by this honestly, don't you? You know what I mean by that? You come from a whole bunch of perfectionists, perfectionists, perfectionists. Okay. Are they perfectionists or are they people with high standards? That's a rhetorical question, but I need you to sit with it because you have these high standards. You have this level of exceptionality. Brian, man, that's a lot to keep up with. That's a lot to keep up with. Somebody who wants a lot out of this world, wants to like, somebody who doesn't know how to chill out by the pond. You know what I mean? Did you guys go to the pond? Uh, the lake. The lake, yeah, the lake. This is very much, this guy's just like, it's time to chill out. And you're like, come on, I got things to fix, I got things to do, I got things to straighten out, I got things to do. So, <laughs> this is what I need you to do, Molly, okay? This is what I, this is, again, I, I could have you do a million things, but this is what I want you to do, is I want you to not look at your perfectionism like it is part of you, okay? I don't want you to look at your perfectionism or your standards like they're part of you. And I, I'm going to ask everybody here to think about some things differently. Words have power. The way we talk about things have power. I really try to not say things like, I am sad. Because I can't be sad. Sadness is external to us. Uh, the Irish language will say something to the effect of, sadness is upon me. Sadness is not us. We're not sadness. I want you to look at your... Uh, standards, your exceptionality, and that's not my word, that's their word, this gold standard of wanting life to be a certain way, that's not you. That's something that you're kind of sitting in, in the same way that perhaps you were given a religion. You know, you're not Christian, but you sit in Christianity, that sort of thing. I want you to think about that, okay? And Here's the important thing, because most of the time I would tell somebody to stop being such a perfectionist, right? I don't want you to stop. And this is important because we need people that have high standards, that want a lot, that strive for a lot, because they set that example for everybody around us. So I need you to see that you are an example to your family, to your loved ones. You're just really stringently clinging to your ideals, like it's life or death. And it's not. So I want you to sit with how important it is to be exceptional, how important it is to have standards and want dreams and hopes and aspirations. But if you can't make it happen to the degree you want to, the world's not falling in around your head. And even more importantly, you're not a failure. Okay? You're not a failure. Now, one of this message, this message is very important because this comes from uh, a man who is really well read. Really, really well read, like a man who would be studious, very smart, very knowledgeable. This is a man who would have had, can I ask you, did you know your dad's dad? Um, some. Not, some. I wasn't close to him. You, you weren't close to him? No, okay. but I knew of him. I knew him. You knew of him, you knew him. Can I ask you, um, you, were, you had that name? Like your dad's name, your dad's dad's last name? I don't know if you have it now, but it's very, like there's a standard of... Exceptionality, like I want things to be good. And this is very much like an ancestral thing that you have going on, is that you know, they just want the best for us. You're really relaying that. But again, how do you find that balance between wanting those standards, wanting everything to be great, but not feeling like a failure if things don't measure up or you don't hit the mark, okay? Do you have anything that's like a sales forecast? I have a sales forecast? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever worked in sales? No. It's hell. Like, truly, hell. 
It is, it is. I mean, the car dealers, you know, the car salesmen, right, having to sell a certain amount of cars a month, cell phone guys having to sell a certain amount of cell phones a month. It's not great. My son does it. Your son does it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and, and I get that. So can I, can I ask you, your son, an exceptional person? Yes. All right. That's not an accident, okay? So again, in the same way that, you know, I want, I want my mom to know that all her efforts and her sacrifices were very much worth it, very much worth it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just beat myself up getting there, okay? So I want you to really, uh, really want you to take that into consideration. Now may I ask, and I might get this flipped between the two of you. Brian, do you want an addition? Do you want an addition? Like an addition to your home? Do you want to expand, make a bigger thing? I'm building a shop. You're building a shop. Okay. Molly, can I ask, do you have problems with that? No. No, I want it. You want it. Okay. So sooner than later. Sooner than later. Okay. So so interesting here. This, so this is this is what I've got for you. So Brian, whatever you're building, like expanding, making bigger, or what have you. So the message that I've got for the both of you is Brian, get it. Do it, get it, get it, run. Get, get really hungry and anxious and it feels really good for you guys. Is, it, is, is there a chance, Brian, that you want something a little bit bigger or a little bit better than Molly is comfortable? She doesn't care, okay. Take that to the bank, we're gonna put it in writing, okay? <laughs> but I, I truly, and this is almost like, and maybe I'm picking up on something that Molly's not having to share with you publicly, but this is just exactly what I want you to know. Whatever your expansion is, whatever the addition is, whatever you're building, full steam ahead. Full steam ahead. And I know, Molly, you're saying here that you're okay with it and you're happy with it and all that. <sighs> whatever, if there's hesitation, just understand that things are moving in that direction for a reason. Okay? Things are very much moving in that direction for a reason. Um, Interestingly enough, whatever that expansion is, whatever that addition is, and this is gonna be a hard question to answer, can I ask you, the way that things lined up to make that happen, can you, can you say that it was like weird, like weird things happened? Yeah. Nothing weird happened? Okay. To uh, what? Okay, are you okay with that? Perfect, perfect, perfect. The reason that I ask this is that, you know how like sometimes we have like star-crossed lovers and you know, things, p things that happen that are faded and destined. It feels like, and maybe you guys can't see it or maybe you're just in the thick of it, it really feels like things are happening from the world of spirit to make that happen. They just want all of that abundance and all of that. And I ask you, do you all have employees? No? You do. Okay, so Molly, do you understand in the way that you have employees that you're making the lives of other people better? Like, you know, when you hire people and they have a living and they're putting food in their cupboard and keeping lights on and what have you, yeah. you're making their lives better. Okay, this is very much, you're supported by your ancestors, your beloved dead. So again, probably just the uh, the example of you are your own worst enemy. You know what I mean? Get out of your own way sort of thing. You know, lean into it. All the, everything around you guys is just lifting you up. And it's very important for you all to see that, okay? Um, Molly, if you have employees, this is probably why this message is coming through. Or just in terms of you loving your life and being really, really important with your life. Um, They really want you to sit with your fear. We all have fear. We all have fear, worry about things going sideways or wrong or anything like that. But I want you to do something for me. Anytime you feel apprehensive or anxious or scared about something, I want you to imagine that Brian is saying it to you or your loved ones are saying it to you and they're bringing you that fear. And then I want you to kind of talk to yourself and give you what you would give somebody else. Uh, because the way that I, I believe her name was Colleen, the way that I asked Colleen if she would be proud of her own daughter, you know, if she'd walk through that life, you're just somebody to be very proud of, okay? And um, the, 
the words that I get around you is you bat a thousand and you can't miss. So whatever it is that you do, you got to be good at it. With the Brian, is she good at it? There's only one answer to that, man. Come on. <laughs> she's good at it. So again, this is very much get out of your own way. Please keep moving in that direction because in that way, I believe that the both of you are just listening to your intuition, just listening to those messages that you're getting and that's what our spirits want for us. Use those examples of me following along, those breadcrumbs of going here and going there and just finding my way. That's what our spirits want for us, okay? Now, do you know what imposter syndrome is? Yes. Okay. Imposter syndrome is feeling like you're an imposter, feeling like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a suggestion here, and I feel like you're going to give me imposter syndrome right back. I'm going to encourage you to sing more, okay? And... <laughs> Wait, are you going to tell me that you can't or you shouldn't? No, I sing in my car. <laughs> really loud. <laughs> That's an energetic release, okay? So what that is, is I want you to, and you must feel better after you sing. You're getting it out. Okay. Sure. <laughs> well, this is what I want you to do, is your anxiety, your stress, your turmoil that's rolling around on the inside of you, I want you to kind of be in constant inventory. And if you know that it's over a five, I want you to go for a drive and I want you to belt it out. Okay? Probably great for the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Everybody, everybody in your home, everything like that, just get it out of you, okay? I keep it a lot, I keep it really light for these group sessions, but the man you miss, misses you. This is very, very, very important. Again, I'm going to keep it light, but that's the message that I've got for you. The man you miss, misses you, and he feels that. So, they're not gone completely, they're just in a different form, Okay? Very important for you to understand that. Um, okay. So in the beginning, when I was talking about my husband and I's life, like I was raised by bikers and he was raised by people who read the Bible. Can I ask you, do, do the two of you have similar, like a similar story? One of you like come from one side of the tracks, the other one comes from the other? Oh. I was um, raised in a very religious household. Ah. And Brian, you weren't? No. Okay. If I don't pass the message through, I don't get another one. So, Brian, you can't take this the wrong way. They're very appreciative of what Molly's done for you. Just, and again, I gotta be very careful with that in terms of, in the same way that Isaac has done a lot for me, you've done a lot for Brian. And I'm not saying that he needed it, I'm just saying that you have been a very positive influence on him. You have been. And I, and I thank you, Brian, for acknowledging that. Now, Brian, for you, that comes from a person who smoked, okay? Very much smoked cigarettes. Or pot, maybe you can, I don't know. I don't know, it's all smoke to me. It's all smoke to me. But again, very, very different sort of, very different sort of spirits that you all have. But the common denominator is love. That's it. So both of you have very much love, and I don't want to, and I think that I'm speaking more to Molly's sense of fear than I am for Brian's. And again, I'm not cementing anything in the future. You guys are lifers, okay? Lifers, it feels like lifers, Molly, lifers, all the way up to your 96, and cooking his butt down the hallway, you know, that sort of thing. You guys are lifers. So that's a message that I'm supposed to bring you, and if you knew, Molly, this is, again, for Molly, not for Brian. Molly, if you knew that y'all were going to last right up into your 90s, for the rest of your life, you never had to worry about anything, look at how much energy you'd have for everything else. So, again, it's very much meeting our own fears and our own worries with the same wisdom and love that we would have somebody else meet theirs. And I want you to do that for me, please. Okay? Thank you. Isaac, if you have enough of those four-leaf clover charms, give one of them to the both of them. Because, Brian, you did say something. So... If you could, Isaac, please walk around over here. One, two, three, four, five, and up. 
Second in. Ah! Ah! Oh, no. <laughs> ah! Okay. So I need to thank you for being here, and I need to thank you for being in the lives of the people that you love. I really do. And here's why. You don't know this, but your advice, your guidance, your wisdom, when you can speak up, very, very, very beneficial. Now, this is interesting because it's like this woman over here that I called a sleeper, right? You're very much a sleeper in that way, in the way that you don't speak up, but then you let it out. You let it out. Now, get to the point where you're not so frustrated and you have to blurt it out. Let it out a little bit prior before you get so frustrated, okay? Now, I want to tell you who these messages are coming from, and this is really important. Um, and again, I can't speak for you. Could I get your name, please? Tammy. Another Tammy. Here we go. All right. So, Tammy, this message is coming from spirits who feel they would not have paid enough attention to you. They feel like they would have neglected you. They didn't pay attention to you. So do you come from like seven or eight kids? How many kids do you have in your family? Four. Four? Okay. So this is very much like, I'm sorry. I don't know. It feels like, you, I don't know if it's middle child syndrome or what. It kind of feels like you're pushed to the side. Twin. You're a twin? Oh, there's a whole lot of stuff there, right? I mean, there is. There's a, there's a whole lot of stuff there. There's a whole lot of stuff to just being a sibling. This is very much like, now, first question, is your twin here? Nope. <laughs> Was that twin the favorite? No. You were the favorite. I'm the favorite. You're the favorite. So maybe this message is for that person, or maybe this is for a person who didn't give you enough of this message to begin with. But what I really need you to see, um, and I got to ask you, uh, do you come from people who lived in a log cabin or built a log cabin of any sort? No? Do you have a cabin? No. Do you want one? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I'm you do? Home. Okay. So, uh, it's a tough question. Could you build your own cabin? Uh, don't sell yourself short. Okay? <laughs> don't sell yourself short. This is really, really important. Now, important question that I have to ask you. Have you given advice to the people you love and have you seen positive change in their life? Yeah. That they've taken? Mm -hmm. Okay. Really need you to speak up. Again, because we tend to be quiet. We tend we don't want to upset the apple cart. This is very much about you speaking up in terms of bringing to balance the lives of the people around you. And this isn't because you're a brilliant know-it-all, because they don't want you to get uh, conceited. They don't want you to have like an inflated head. They very much want you to see that the intelligence that you bring to your family, your friends, your tribe, very useful. It's just needed, okay? And that's not to say that the people around you don't have any. It's just that you have this, uh, the term that I receive is old soul. Have people called you that? Old soul, wise, what have you? Did you come with anybody today? Yep. Right. Okay. Discuss. I'm not going to ask that one over there. She's That's grumpy. my daughter-in-law. <laughs> my daughter-in-law. You too. My best friends. Okay. Is she wise? Yes. Okay. I mean, I have a feeling that you would say no if she wasn't. Okay? You're right? Okay. So she's wise. Okay. Have you both seen her advice be taken by people around her and you in the betterment, are you, two, are you two an example of that? You have, okay, good, 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 good. All right, so Tammy, I told you, and I told everybody here, that I would, before this evening is up, give everybody the secret to life. Okay, this is important, and this is what I do, and this is everything that people, People see me, and this is really important to my message, so anybody who's ever seen me before knows that I'm going to give them this, and here's why. It's really important that I remind everybody that I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. It's really important to remind people that they have the answer. Okay. So, Tammy, because you have broad shoulders, I'm going to have you do this with me, okay? And I'm going to walk you through some thought exercises that I want everybody here to walk through. Now, this is interesting. I think one of your guiding principles, guiding lights, is peace. 
No bullshit, right? No drama. Right. Now, friends, is she a drama mama or does she like it simple, peaceful? Simple and peaceful, okay. So we're gonna strip it down to its basics. We're gonna strip right down to its most simplest. And I'm gonna use you, Tammy, here because you have broad shoulders, but I want everybody here in this room to walk through this thought exercise with me, please. Tammy, do this for me, and I want everybody here to do this. Will you please take the part of yourself, everybody's got a little part, take the part of yourself that you dislike the most, physically, cosmetically, and put it in your mind for me. Got it? Okay. I want you to imagine that your friends, your loved ones, your daughter-in-law, everybody, was feeling that way about that attribute. And I want you to put into your mind what you would tell your loved ones if they were feeling that way about that thing. They're different, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, this world of ours that we live in really, really suffers because most every woman, if not all women, were born into a world that said, maybe she's born with it, maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> Truly. Truly. If you were born 5,000 years ago, you'd be too worried about pulling fish out of the river than what your reflection was in it. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the next, I want you to please take and put into your mind the biggest regret, guilt, shame, one of them, something along those lines. Put that in your mind. You got it? I want you to imagine that your loved ones, even a stranger, was feeling that way about that scenario, about that situation. And I want you to put into your mind what you would tell that person. You can see they're different, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, bringing it home, I want you to take the biggest problem in your life, the biggest problem that you're dealing with that's external to your heart, external to your mind, and I want you to think about if somebody that you loved had that problem. And if somebody you loved had that problem, I want you to think about the advice that you would give them. You see how they're different? Mm -hmm. Okay. What I've just showed you is this. This is really vital to my message. A lot of folks don't like what I have to share because I like to tell people that love is a responsibility. Love is a responsibility. I love my mother. I'm responsible for taking care of her son. I love my son. I'm responsible for taking care of his father. I love my husband. I'm responsible for taking care of his husband. That's a responsibility. That also includes our heart and our mind. And I'm a firm believer that love is not an emotion. Love is a force we feel emotionally. We also feel it mentally, we feel it physically, we feel it spiritually. But I want you to think about this. When you have to carry a burden for somebody that you love, I want you to think about how strong you become. And I want you to think about when you have to solve a problem for somebody you love, I want you to think about how smart you become. And you see with love and intelligence and strength, they're all there, it's all the same. The secret to life is this, and it's a bold statement, and it's not 100% applicable to every scenario. The secret to life is this. One question, what would I tell my kid? What would I tell my kid? What would I tell my sister? What would I tell my loved one? And you really feel like uh, you're very organized. Do you, got, like, do you like making lists? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just handed him my list. I just showed him my list. <laughs> yeah, you like making lists. I have two lists. <laughs> I have two lists. In my back pocket. You have two lists in your back pocket. Yeah, I just made them today. They're in my back pocket. I'm going to give you a third list to make, please. Okay? And this is something that I want everybody to do. Because if everybody in this room truly wants peace, they're going to do this. Take a blank sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle. On the left-hand side, I want you to write down the biggest problems that you have. The problems in your heart, in your mind, and in your life. And then on the right-hand side, I want you to write down what you would tell a kid. 
Truly, what you would tell a kid. Because what happens is over the course of our life, something that I've learned from spirit and something that we all learn when we pass on is this. When we pass on, we get the perspective that we are nothing but really messed up algebra equations. We are the sum of our parts. If you and I traded birthdays, if you and I traded genders, if you and I traded fathers, we'd be completely different people. When we move to the world of spirit, we understand that. And I think it's vital for us to get to that place while we're alive as best we can. If we want our loved ones and spirit to rest in peace, we will do everything we can to live in peace. Everything we can to live in peace. The only way we're going to live in peace is if we give ourselves the love, the grace, the compassion, the strength, the intelligence that we so freely give the people around us. It may be the most spiritual thing that I tell you, but if you really confronted your problems, your turmoils, with the same strength and ferocity that you confront the problems and turmoils of the people you love, you'd have very few problems. Right? Yeah. Okay. And that's the same for all of us. Now, for religious people, for religious folks, and I don't have anything against religion, I think every belief system, every thought system, will have people that abuse it and take advantage of it, truly. But for religious folks and people that believe in God and Jesus, the, the saying, the kingdom of God lives within, that's what they're talking about. Because if God is love, love is in you, you walk right into this world with love, and if you can access it, you're going to really simplify your life. You're really going to simplify your life. If that's the secret to life, what would I tell my kid? Now, Isaac, I'm going to ask you, where are you? Ah, right there. How many of those four-leaf clover charms do you have left? Five. Okay. Would you give one to her, please? So we are at the end of this evening. And if left to my own devices, I would go three or four hours, truly. But this is the key part of my message. If you want to live in peace, you're going to do for yourself as you would have a child do. Now, Tammy, because you were my very last one and you had the broadest shoulders, you're going home with this. Welcome. So this is what I would invite everybody to do, please. Everybody that leaves here, everybody's leaving with their beloved dead, their ancestors. Listen to your intuition. That's it. Not asking you guys to do anything. Listen to your intuition. Listen to those gut instincts. Listen to those nudges. And here are some things that I need you to pay attention to. Pay attention to your smells. Your spirits are going to show you them in smells, first and foremost, before anything. They're going to show you. The smell is so connected to our memory, but it is the very first doorway into our consciousness that they will speak through. The next piece, before everybody tears out, I'm going to take a picture of you beautiful people. The next piece is this. Pay attention to spirits of air. Pay attention to birds. Pay attention to dragonflies. Butterflies, pay attention to spirits of air. Our spirits will somehow, and I don't know how, I don't believe they become the butterflies or the cardinals, but they influence the spirits of air. So if you have ever seen a bird or a butterfly or a dragonfly or a hummingbird or a cardinal, and in that moment you feel it was somebody sending you a message, it absolutely was. The next piece, pay attention to your dreams especially the dreams that come to you in the middle of the night between 3 a.m. and dawn. That is their way of saying hello. And this is it. Everybody here is going to pass away. We all are. That's what we have in common. Everybody here is going to pass away. Everybody here is going to go to the other side of that one-way mirror and become the intuition for your loved ones. That's what we do. We go to the other side and we watch and we care for and we pay attention. And it's really vital that we do our damnedest to live in peace while we can 
Because if we can live in peace, we're going to show our kids, we're going to show our loved ones how to live in peace. And then when we go to the world of spirit and we're watching over everybody, we're at peace. Because we're not yelling at the TV screen. Because that's what we do. So again, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you.